today we had on Dr. Pran Yoganathan, and uh, this was the second time we had him on. We covered things from like Carl Jung philosophy, and he's gone really deep and esoteric into a lot of deep, dark things. And it was just really cool to see his um, and listen to his whole change in the last two years. It was quite fascinating, but he's just amazing. Eh? He's such a legend. Yeah, it was just a, a conversation on the curiosities that we all have about, about everything, about death, about self-reflection, about what we are. Um, you know, it's funny, we're talking to a gastroenterologist, we didn't talk about the gut yeah. once. <laughs> <laughs> once so. But that's what we wanted to talk about. That's just that's what came out. I mean, you know, I yeah. didn't really write any questions down. There was a couple of questions we wrote down, but didn't ask one of them. It just went the way we like it to go. So, mm. he's such a cool guy um, and unique, just a unique man. And that's why we're all watching him and listening to him, right? So, give it a listen. Yeah, much love. GG's lads, welcome back to the Corrective Culture Podcast. <laughs> we Today, for the second time, we have Dr. Pran, but we've all grown and we're excited to get into it. Yeah, man. It's um, it's really cool to watch watch your development from the start that I've seen anyone on social media and even the content slowly change. Like your content started on, on gut health, really, I'd say. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and now it's gone into, into how can I describe it? More... Um, I guess philosophy, philosophy, but more asking questions and making the viewer ask questions. That's what it's sort of doing to me. It makes me reflect I'm like, whoa, I never thought about things like that, you know? And it's like, it pauses, it stops me in my tracks for a second. So I love, I love the stuff you're getting into at the moment, man. And, and, um, and again, trying to, trying to find that balance in what you're doing is really cool. Mm. Thanks, man. Yeah. I, I think um, it's, very easy to get cast into a, a specific role uh, that I guess society asks of you and platforms like social media um, to kind of promote and then reiterate the same message uh, forever. It's easy to do that. And, uh, you know, to do that, you've also got to kind of polarise on a specific topic as well. It, it's great for likes and follows and uh, whatnot, but are you really incentivizing people to think? Are you delving into um, or, or kind of clawing at the fabric of truth? Um, all of those things are really important to me. Truth, liberty, uh, love, those sort of concepts uh, are, are critical for me. And uh, I guess I'm, in a way, writing for myself more than anything else. Mm-hmm. I'm asking questions of myself and um, I'm happy to put it out there and and um, and kind of take people on that journey with me, the, the people that want to go on the journey. I've, I've found uh, my message as it's become, I guess, a little bit more esoteric, um, there seems to be less people interested in it. Um, but, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of doing something that's true to my soul and uh, something that, that um, I, I feel like I was destined to do. So, yeah, it's just a personal journey, guys, and... Hopefully uh, it doesn't come across as um, overly pompous or anything like that because it, it, it literally is me asking questions, you know, and yeah. inquiring. Mm. Yeah, I love it. I think it's I think it's great. And like Callan said, it's definitely – it makes you question things. And I'm very much into the, the similar kind of thing where I like to ask bigger questions and why we're here and what's going on and behind the scenes and – and all that kind of stuff. So I'm very much enjoying it. And I think that, yeah, it's like it does, yeah, the fo- the followers don't necessarily like to think t- too deep sometimes, you know what I mean? And I think that when it goes goes deep, like I have the same thing, like my meditative stuff that I would put out there gets zero, like 10% of what it would if I was to do a movement video, you know what I mean? But what's, what's true to me is the, the meditation stuff makes me feel good inside and like you said, following your soul probably the most important thing but who knows it could blow up and it could be like hundreds of thousand people following that and, and learning from that so it's pretty powerful yeah, yeah yeah i think um i think the ancient uh, hindu philosophers had an interesting term for uh what they described as as the dark age you know where mankind becomes overly obsessed with the external version of himself um the human body in particular 
and uh, they they talked about an era where they fundamentally become obsessed with the with the physical self, and and DR desires are all purely physically based. Whereas when you talk about concepts like meditation, you're really talking about introspection into the mind, which is less tangible, right? Like you're moving less away from the body and more into the realm of the mind. Um, so it's kind of opposite to that that age that they spoke about. But the vast majority um, kind of had this concept that they are the body, that, that really they've lost that idea that there might potentially be a... Uh, more divine uh, nature to us. And I think meditation and other modalities allow you to explore that aspect of yourself. But you're right, it, it's not its not exactly what you'd call popular content. Um, but, you know, it is uh, it is what it is. I think, I think it is an important journey for uh, anyone to go on, you know, because ultimately the mind is everything. And, um, you know, the, the reality that we construct around us emerges from the mind and... Uh, got to try and fathom that to the best of our ability yeah it's like uh it's it's that balance hey because there's a there's a good quote i heard i think did paul say it it's like if, if when you don't respect matter matter takes you out and what i take from that is is well i guess the example he was using was like all right people are just going through everyday life it's it's a one-way street so they won't ever look the opposite way you know, just because the sign says it, but there could still be someone going down the the, the one way street the wrong way, and then your 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 journey's over, right? So we're all in our like green light, red light, do this, do that, but also and with the mind, also respecting the body, because I've I've found and and as you would know, it's it's like it's not one or the other, hey, and it's it's crazy. I just did a trip in Japan, man, and eating poor quality food for. 13 days, a lot poor to what, what I'm used to, right? And what I took from that trip was it was very hard to be healthy of what my level of health would be with just eating, getting protein, even getting enough protein was very hard there, I found. It was all pork and probably not great quality pork. It was very hard to find a normal steak. It was all Wagyu. And God, like I felt, I had Wagyu steak one night and the next day my face was so puffy that I could, and I'm, I can really feel this stuff. It's night and day for me. I could turn my head and I could feel the, the pull of water down to my neck all the way through here. And it was, it was like, okay, that's, and I felt inflamed. My joints hurt a little bit, but not only did I feel inflamed, my, I didn't feel good in the head. Like it wasn't, it didn't feel like something. And I probably could have with practice. I could have thought my way out of, I just, my serotonin wasn't as high, whatever it was. It was, I could have done, I could have went snowboarding that day, but I wouldn't have been unhappy as happy as if I wasn't. I didn't respect my body. So I was thinking, fuck, if I could do a trips like that and also treat my body well, it's, it's, mm, they not, come not hand in hand. hand eh? Yeah. Mm. It's like, you, you know, you can, you can meditate, but if you're feeling like shit from your diet all the time or your cortisol, or whatever that is, it's such a, a dance that we constantly got to play of not going too far one way or the other. But um, I find I personally, when I'm, when I have all those foundations on point, God, my mind is just, uh, I see more positivity in the world com- compared to if I don't, you know, yeah. and, and what's, what's your experience been like with that? Like, I know you're pretty onto your food and whatnot, but, um, and you got your farm happening, like your whole structure at the moment is so cool of mm. changing the world with the dollar, but changing the world with the soil and, and that the soil is, 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 is everything, is life, is right? <laughs> is, is the mushroom, is, is, is the consciousness, the original consciousness. So it's like, have you um have you dealt with any of your own sort of health issues in that sense that's that's changed your mind? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think I've definitely it's been a it's been a long journey uh, in terms of correcting my diet, improving my health uh, into my mid forties, uh, and and I think the way I look at the human body is the human body is kind of the receiver of this this uh, large mind or field of consciousness that we we uh, we inhabit and, and walk through. So it, it's really important to get a temple in order mm. in order to be able to receive a very clear signal, if that makes sense. Yeah. And the body is what the earth is and the body becomes what the soil is fundamentally. That's we, our body is food and all food is grown in soil, so uh, theoretically speaking, soil equals the body. Yeah. So 
Um, that that was my whole pursuit of trying to understand what the process of farming is. I mean, it's a very very foreign territory for for me to be in because I certainly don't have a family background in in farming, uh, not in the in the uh, recent past anyway. Um, perhaps a few generations ago we were, were all farmers, but it, so it's embedded there somewhere in my genes that memory. But but um, I had to go down that old pathway of, of learning how to farm and and uh, learning what the steps to farming are and what the what the actual nuance and science behind it is. And uh, look, I'm, I'm not claiming to be an expert and I certainly need a lot of help. And I'm very lucky that I've got a, a, a guy who helps me manage my farm who's got many, many decades of experience. He's been doing it since he was a kid and I think he's close to approaching 70 now. So that's wow. just a wealth of experience, right? Mm. And he's been able to teach me a lot and um, advise me on how things are done. So I'm, I'm humbly accepting guidance while whilst uh, learning. But in, in regards to your question as to whether the body must be cared for, absolutely. I mean, no, no god ever dwelt in a temple that was overgrown and left to rot with weeds. And it's the same with, with our body. I think it's if you're going to house the soul um, within the construct of the body, you've got to have that temple in, in, in order. Uh, but in saying that, you know, some of the some of the content um, that that you might have seen from me, it also kind of takes you to a dark place, and and you know, potentially when you're in that space, maybe diet's not exactly optimal. Um, you might drink a little bit more to kind of ease ease the the discomfort in which you're in. Um, it's it's all a it's all a journey, guys. And mm, mm. you know, I think it's very easy to sit there and preach perfect diets on social media, but what really goes on behind the scenes, you know, and I, I'm not I'm not perfect. I'm not I'm not um perfect. And sometimes you do tend to gravitate towards foods that are a little or drinks that are, that allow you a little bit of that hedonism to kind of um to, to ease the pain of that journey that you might potentially be on mm. because a journey can't be all light. You can't just walk towards the light and, and be uh, compelled towards it. You've got to experience both poles of it. You've got to be able to experience the light, hold the darkness, feel happiness, um, hold, hold sadness. And um, to be able to experience the entire spectrum of emotions and and feelings, I think that makes you a complete person rather than, um, you know, preaching, preaching perfection, which is very mm. easy to do on mm. um, various social media platforms that we've got. So a lot of my content is also focused on being able to be vulnerable and, um, you know, holding vulnerability. And I enjoy seeing vulnerability in my mates and, yeah. and my clients now and helping to be able to hold that space with them rather than quickly gloss over it. Um, which which we've got a society that is hell bent on that. I mean, we ask people how they are, and we we immediately expect the response of "Well, I'm good," and then you sort of move on beyond that formality. But I think it'd be great to live in a world where you ask someone how they are, and if they respond saying they're in a difficult place, to be able to hold it without having discomfort and um, and and just helping talk talk through that with that with that individual i think would, there would be some elegance in that um, and i've certainly been trying to do that more with with clients um and my patients which which is very very rewarding but also from an empathetic perspective extremely exhausting as well so it's about kind of finding the balance you know i can kind of understand why a lot of doctors distance themselves from the emotional needs of their patients because it is a huge burden to carry but at the same time, once you've developed that disconnection between doctor and patient, then it just becomes a pure transactional relationship. It's 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 um, it's it's kind of meaningless, leaves you hollow. So I think we need to develop more um, more meaningful connections. You know, um, transactional relationships are, are fundamentally um, fundamentally flawed. And eventually must lead to nihilism, you know. So um, it's much the same as transactional sex, I suppose. It 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 carries very little meaning. I think we we've got to try and cultivate um, real um, human to human connection. And um, and 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 you know, as Ram Das uh, beautifully said, we're, we're to paraphrase, and we're all kind of just walking each other home. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it's really important to to to. to kind of appreciate that facet of life. Yeah, I think like having the energy for that, like because how many clients do you take daily? 
I've had to cut it down, um, mate. I've had to, you know, seriously reduce the numbers that that I see. I'm seeing maybe at the most eight to ten. You know, yeah. when I started, you know, I've seen you know maybe triple that. You wow. know, start morning and see triple that. But but I realise like I'd rather have longer interactions, uh, less kind of throughput. So yeah, definitely my my income personally as a doctor has um, certainly certainly uh taking a bit of a hit but but that's fine i'm 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 there's much more job satisfaction let's put it that way yeah exhausted from an empathetic perspective yeah i'm certainly depleted uh running on empty in that regard um but but you know i, I do feel like there are aspects to life which is um the, 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 we've got to make sacrifices and uh what is life but kind of service to others really and so uh, I accept that that potentially my health may suffer the consequences of that, uh, but I'll try my best to keep everything I can within to, to the limits of my ability from a physical and emotional perspective. But but at the same time, I think it's important to delve in uh, and into the mud, so to speak, because we can't just keep walking in a field of flowers all the time. It's as I said before, it's really important to experience. Um, the poles of, of uh, emotions and, and and to be able to kind of really hold that space uh, comfortably, uh, I think then you, you you become a master um, at, at 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 life. I'm I'm very far from that, boys. I'm not sitting here preaching about that, but I certainly um, um, certainly on that journey to be able to uh, to master both poles. Yeah, oh, man, that's um it's that's important. Eh? That's beautiful about hearing hearing about the relationship with the. Because you can call them patients, clients, what, whatever. But the the model is is, and I, I see this. I'm seeing this more, I guess, in uh, even like my my mother and my father's generation, and I guess even still for some young kids coming up, of like the relationship between the the professional and them is is the father father or the mother and the child, basically is is what I'm I'm seeing all the time, right? And of of a young perspective of like, okay. The, the doctors, my mum and my dad, tell me what to do. Tell me what, tell me what my body's feeling. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. And there's no, uh, no connection there or connection to themselves primarily, but also even being inspired by that connection from the, the practitioner's knowledge instead of like telling them, no, you do this or you have this and this is it and this is certain, like everyone's always certain about their thing. Um, and I think it just makes people again, makes them think more and reflect more and then empower them more. And that, that's, um, that's rare. That's very rare today. And, and, and it does take extra time. You can't do that in 20 minutes, you know? And do you know Stuart McGill? Stuart McGill, the cricketer? No, Stuart McGill, the back pain. He's got back mechanic. You may, he's like the spine sort of guys. The The McGill big three is like a, like a rehab model of his sort of stuff. But um, his sessions with clients are three hours, right? And he talks about the physiotherapy model and whatnot. And man, like, I just think about, I had, I had a girl recently and I needed three hours with her. You know, I didn't need two. I didn't need one. Like, I needed all three hours with her to get what we needed done. And it's it's the model that's that's hard. And I feel like it's the, the practitioners almost, um, not even by choice, it's just by what they have to do. Like, I've got to get eight of these people through. It's just what I got in 20 minutes. And I just think... Fuck! I couldn't have even scratched the surface. Like she, she would have still been in pain if I had it for twenty minutes. And um, I guess the people that had changed that are people that are passionate, that will go over time. And that's what you represent to me, and that's what these other people represent to me is is the passion shines through, and then the passion is linked with curiosity, and and then you learn forever. Like you never, you'll never stop learning. And, um, not sure what the question was in that, but I just had to sort of get. <laughs> yeah, that's, no, what, that's I, what I'm getting. I, I agree. I agree. I agree. I mean, let's look at it this way, right? Okay. I mean, yeah, I talk a lot about the construct of space and time, the cosmos and the universe being the construct of space and time. It, 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 a lot of consciousness researchers believe that consciousness lies outside of space and time. Now, if 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 we're talking about two consciousnesses or two conscious agents, which is you and this woman, interacting with each other, right, on, on the on the scale outside the universe, there is no time. 
and it's just two units of consciousness interacting with each other. But once you drop them into these avatars, which are the bodies that you guys inhabit, you're almost bound to time. Mm. And but but time in itself is a, is a massive illusion. And I think we're overly obsessed with it. And you can see here, there's no watches on the wrist. I, I detest mm. the idea of being changed mm. by time. But and and you know, I almost. Uh, in a way, psychologically eliminated time out of my life, but really suffered the consequences. And 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 I I saw someone brilliant who kind of really helped me along that journey. And she said to me, um, uh, she said to me, Pran, the way you navigate the universe is by using the anchor of time. You need time to be able to navigate the universe because if you're not navigating space and time adequately, you're fundamentally outside of space and time, and then you're really dead to the world. Uh, if that makes wow. sense. Yeah. We, 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 are, we do need time to be able to navigate the world, but at the same time, if we're talking about two units of consciousness um, interacting and truly interacting, well, if you're bound completely by time, you, you, you can never interact in a holistic and uh, complete way. So I, I, I do think we, we have to find the balance there. I'm not saying why I'm spending, you know, that I don't look at the clock when my clients are concerned, mm. but uh, I'm trying to have more meaningful interactions with them within the limits of what I can do. Uh, you can't always run three, four, five hours late. It simply <laughs> wouldn't allow for uh, any form of practice. Um, mm. So, but, but that concept of time is really interesting um that that we within the construct that we've got now we we're, we're bound by time but um if we were outside of space and time you've just got these units of consciousness interacting without the without the chain yeah and it makes you it makes you think about obviously thinking about death right and how when we think about time i'm not sure if i spoke to you about this but matt walden sort of told me about this was how if we think about what are what are the first thoughts of time in our evolution? When did time start to become a thing? And the early thoughts would have been, okay, there's there's tracks there, an animal was there. If I follow those tracks, there's going to be food in the future instead of this present mm-hmm. thing, right? Which is deep <laughs> if you think about that, yeah, right? Yes. And then when you know about time, then you got to know that you die. And then if you know about death, then you got to think of there's then religions come into play of what's after death and these thoughts of after death and and um and it it all comes back to time <laughs> of, of this yeah i always think about like thoughts too like thoughts are in english like <laughs> you yeah. know like what 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 were they before we had language maybe it would have been feeling maybe it would have been like what we can smell and hear and see and just images and images yeah like yeah, it's an that, interesting that, that food thing. Yeah, and and have, when you when you yeah. think about death, man, and this is a question that I guess no one can really properly answer. But do you get a a feeling of peace from it? Do you get a feeling of of fear from it? Do you get a feeling of there's definitely something more, or or what what do you what's your feeling? Death is a very interesting concept, uh, guys, and it's something that I've uh, contemplated deeply probably in the last two to three years. I'm not particularly fearful of death. I view death as an adventure and on to the next one. I think it's important to uh, reiterate that concept that I spoke about earlier, that our brains are not creating our consciousness, rather receiving it. Our brains and our bodies um, are mere avatars that receive this consciousness. Um, Most Eastern philosophy in the very earliest Christian philosophies focused on rebirth and death, that, that we went through cycles of birth, death, birth, death. And death in itself is a huge illusion for the um, divine nature of our being, which is the soul. So really, does death terrify me? Not really. Um, am I looking forward to it? Yes, to a to an extent, because I view it as an adventure. It doesn't mean that I I want to I want to cut my life short. I've, I've got things that I need to achieve whilst I'm on this body. Uh, mm. Things to learn. I've got much to learn. I'm a, I'm an imperfect. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a man with significant imperfections, and there's aspects of my myself that I would like to move. You know, work on. So. Um, uh, it, 
death to me terrifies me when I think of a loved one, like say I think of my sons or daughters, uh, my two daughters, uh, losing them to me would, would be um, extremely terrible. So, But that, again, is from a selfish perspective. Um, mm. That's my ego saying, well, losing them would be a hit would be a huge uh, blow to my ego. But death, Jung said, Jung and um, actually I, I posted it this morning, a, a Jungian analysis, uh, Anne-Marie Frain said, death is like moving in the realm of images where time doesn't exist. Mm. It's almost like every memory um, that ever existed in not only your mind, but every mind that has ever uh, existed within the cosmos. Um, you, you're moving through uh, the, the, that that realm. Just it's all. It must be like a reel almost that we see on Instagram. These reels of images, and we're just flicking through them and moving through them. Our our very consciousness. And I think it probably at the moment of death, it probably removes the separation of our egos, where we think of ourselves as separate entities. Um, and I think that unified field of consciousness becomes one. Um, so it, it's it, it's something that we should all ponder. But modern society has made us terrified of death. It, mm. It's it's uh, painted these images of hellish uh, repercussions for people that lead a life of sin and potentially utopia for people that have lived well. I don't think that sets people up to explore these concepts very well because it becomes too painful to, for, for for them to think about. But if you're looking at it um, as more of a well, it, it's it's a, a, a time where where if one was to close their eyes from death, the actual limitations of the body are removed and we're restored to our original um, powerful selves. Well, that, that, that's a that's an exciting way to view it. But mm. you know, when you, you can't discuss these ideas necessarily. In, in society because people are very, very conditioned uh, to be uncomfortable around these sort of topics. I, um, I was listening to this guy's near-death experience the other day and I what I took from it was that he was telling the truth. This was his experience. I could see it in his eyes, the way he was talking, that he wasn't lying. It was his experience, right? He was a firefighter. And when he, he passed and obviously came back, but when he passed, he goes, I, I went, I left my body and I went out and then all of a sudden, almost like you're talking about the archaic records or something like that, right? He goes, it was exactly like you said, like uh, almost like a kaleidoscope, but it changes with images. And he goes, and you could research anything you wanted to know of how this was made, what this, it was like the entire information to the universe was there and you could play and learn. And then he goes, and then I saw three beings and they were energies. They didn't have faces, but they were pure. I was pulled towards them and there was no fear. It was like love. And then he goes, I saw them. And then they go, so how was it? Like, what'd you learn? <laughs> and then he was like, he, he was a firefighter. So he had all these processes still in himself. And he's like, oh, this must be a process. I must have to do this and rah, rah, rah. So he goes, oh, I learned this. So he goes, I didn't really regret anything. I love this. And then he goes, so, you know, what's next? What's the process? And then they looked at him and started laughing. They're like, oh, yeah, okay, tell us your processes. And they're like, he doesn't remember us, does he? And they're like, nah. And they just started laughing. Wow, and then, th- and that was sort of the it, and he went back to his body somehow, right? But what, um, which is an amazing thing, like, like from whatever, whatever this was, they were laughing at the seriousness of his his experience when he came back to the this real world, whatever we would call <laughs> it. But when you think like that, when you think about death and and I guess the end of it all. Do you get a sense of peace of when when we look at all the things that are wrong in the world and how there's always this chaos, it's always this yin-yang and there always will be in some sense, but when we look at all the negatives of the world, do you get a sense of peace of thinking we all think this is more serious than it is because our time we're thinking for the next 50, 100 years or whatnot and really maybe we're thinking of children and their their life on this earth, right? Um or do, you, do you, or do you get a sense of like it's 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 still serious, but we're all dead anyway, and not this this is just the the playground. What what feeling do you get with that? Yeah, and this is what I struggle with. Um, to be to to be quite honest with you, that that um, over over time, my my feelings towards the construct of our modern day reality just changed. Um, where where I do see it 
as a game uh, fundamentally and um, and it's very difficult to take that seriously. Mm-hmm. I'd rather talk on, on more important matters as, uh, with regards to matters of the soul and tell me what's what's on your mind really rather than kind of focus on the negative news that is constantly propagated. And, and I, I do feel like a lot of that negativity is propagated to keep people distracted away from what they are, you know, and, and if people are constantly suspended in fear, uh, fear drives them more towards more of an identification with the body rather than their soul. I do believe if, if society knew the eternal nature of themselves, they, they it's very difficult to be suspended in fear um, if you know that you're fundamentally an immortal um, energy inhabiting a a uh, mortal body. Uh, but but you know it is very difficult to uh, take. A lot of that negative stuff that's coming on the news very, very seriously at all. And in fact, to be honest, I've deviated away from from the negative uh, mm. stuff. It's just focusing on understanding what we are, and also perhaps taking people on a journey to uh, towards that that uh, understanding. But I do realise, like, um, if we're talking about the journey of the soul, there are people that are far more advanced in their soul's journey than than others that might be younger. And I think. You just have to let people learn in their own time, whether it's through this lifetime or, or, or the next. Let people go on that specific journey. Let's not force them and impose our will onto others, uh, but teach the ones that that are willing to learn. And and it's uh, and on the flip side, for me, I'm willing to learn from others that that have thought about this concepts more deeply. And there are plenty of people out there mm. that are just far more advanced in in that in that aspect of rummed us better physical. <laughs> And I am. Um, so it's a constant learning process, guys. And, you know, I think uh, if there's one kind of takeaway message on that on that topic, uh, I think people just have to stay open and not be confined to their ideological upbringings that they might have had, whether it's in Christianity, uh, Hinduism or, or Islam. Uh, I think we've really got to almost um, put aside the, the historical text and focus more on, well, What's my soul telling me? You know, what 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 really is within? And when you are constantly introspecting, a lot of those answers are almost downloaded into your into your consciousness. And I think uh, it's important to listen to them and and uh, focus on them and and give them space and uh, and to be able to hold them within as well. So um, it, it's 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 a journey of epic proportions. Yeah, uh, I think like. So what I take from that really is like you need to, that introspection thing is like cultivating the witness is one of the most important things we can do as a human. So creating that witness consciousness so we can actually, which is meditation and things like that and self introspection, seeing what triggers you and things like that. So we can actually get a clear download and see it's like we're only at the tip of the iceberg with our thoughts. But then down here is all this stuff kind of just comes up like you said like a filing cabinet comes out the other day i was meditating and i this thought popped in randomly about when i ran away from my mum holding her hand as a kid and i was like what the fuck was that maybe i had Mm. some unprocessed stuff but this is like that you're almost like dealing in a in a different consciousness in a in a different vibration that allows you to see a little more or understand why you hear a little more maybe i don't know it's so hard to find words when you're when really what you're talking about is is you can't really put into words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, words words are a poor description yeah, it's to just... describe the world beyond, right? Yes. And we've got these vocal cords that limit us. We've got these neural processes and neural circuitry that limit us. I, I do believe in the um, realm outside of space and time, yeah. language is, is not – it's simply not communicated that way and i do believe in that in that realm we're kind of held together by by love and a lot of people that experience near death uh, near death um, uh, scenarios do talk about that overwhelming sense of love as they move towards the light and near death experiences should not be laughed at and 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 science has explored them in great depth mm. uh, 
and you can find articles sure. articles on on big databases like PubMed, which we use. It's just very few people read these sort of things, but the research is out there, and um, there are countless stories which are identical to what you, this this gentleman that you've um, recently uh, watched his story. Uh, they almost identical to that, mm. and I'm sure there are a few people that kind of um, uh, you know put on a few <laughs> stories. But when you've got multiple tens of thousands of people recounting their near-death experiences and there's an element of um, singularity to it or, or commonality, very, very difficult to ignore that. I think we have to listen to that. And um, that it, it, it does appear that that the realm beyond, uh, we're not limited as much as we are by the body. And it's probably... At the moment of passing, it's probably like a dream. You 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 wake up to this reality outside of the cosmos, and um, and the life that you were before almost fades like a dream. It's like you you, you have this really vibrant, really crazy dream, yeah. um, and you wake up in the morning and it over and, and it feels very real. But over the period of the next 30 to 40 minutes, it, it fades to a point where you don't even remember it anymore. That's probably what our lives are like on the other side. It, it almost becomes a dream that fades and all the all the love and all the all the bonds that we had with people uh, over over on the other side probably, uh, again, just kind of fade away, never to be lost because they're trapped within that primordial cloud storage device. Mm. Uh, and, and I guess another name could could be God for that, but uh, they're not lost forever. But you 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 awaken from the the, the dream that you've been suspended in. Um, yeah, is what is what I is That's, what my humble opinion is. <laughs> Sometimes I feel fear of when we think of the life and death. Cause that's what I've looked into a lot. It's it's sort of a constant circle of dying, dying, and being reborn. And sometimes that's the fear I have is it never ends. I can't. You can't escape if you want to. <laughs> yeah, you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, um, yeah. The, the earliest Christians, the Gnostic Christians, who were deemed um, heretics by the um, by the, the the Roman Church, um, the the earliest Christians believed in that concept that that this was indeed space and time was almost a prison presided over uh, this mythical creature they call the Demiurge, which they got that idea from uh, Plato, the great philosopher. Mm -hmm. But the Demiurge is, is thought to be the creator of the construct of space and time. He's actually a very malevolent force that rules over what they call the prison. And to be able to ex escape the prison and to join the entity of love that lies beyond the prison was a process of self actualization where you realize what we are. And to do that, it is going through these multiple cycles of birth and death. Um, you know, in Eastern philosophy, it is said when one achieves um, a state of self actualization, their cycles of birth and death kind of end almost and uh, they're re reconnected with that source beyond. So, there appears to be some level of intersection between the earliest forms of Christianity and the uh, and Eastern philosophy, which is very very interesting. When when any time anything intersects, it always grabs my attention. I always mm. sit up and uh, take take note of that. But I do believe that the process of uh, metempsychosis or reincarnation or transmigration of the soul. There's many ways to put it has been taken out deliberately from the, the great uh, theological systems that were resulted for a reason. That reason I'm not quite certain about, but I think in, from the moment we're born, we, we, we're told that we're born into original sin, that we're all sinners by birth, and uh, you've got to lead a life of obedience to reach utopia. And if you don't lead a life of obedience, well, hell awaits I think um, that that is more more of the fear mongering that I'm speaking about. To 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 rule over people, you need to suspend them in fear. So to rule over the eight billion that exist on our planet, we need to constantly suspend them in fear, utilizing various um, algorithms, the news, etc. There's very little good news anymore. But the more fearful people are, the easier they are to control. These are these are steps that were clearly defined by a ex KGB. 
um, um, individual who spoke about the seven steps of communism. It's uh, part of it is is really uh, creating a lot of fear in in a, in a population. So uh, theologically, I do believe we create fear. I think we tell people that if they sin and so forth, well, they're doomed to a life of hell. I think that's a very simplistic way to look at it. Uh, it might be a controversial uh, thought process that I'm having here, but but I, I believe there's no such thing as a mistake. There's only ways to learn and uh, ways to improve yourself. And we've got eternity, it appears, to, 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 to do that. Yeah. On, on this, upon this prison planet, which uh, which at times you think, shit, is it really a prison? Because you you stand back and observe the beauty and the majestic nature of um, of our planet and our universe, and you think it's it's not too bad for a prison. Is it? Yeah, <laughs> it's a short term playground. Hey, it's like, yeah. man, even with, well, I was in prison, right? And I thought it wasn't even that bad. Like, I <laughs> I didn't feel like it's funny. Funny enough. I'd never really felt trapped. That was, and that's my psyche, I think, coming through with that. Yeah. But um, even when I was like put in my, my little cell at night, couldn't leave till 7 a.m. Would have been nice. It was nice. Yeah. Like, you know, it was like just chilling. Like yeah. I, I was writing poetry in there. I haven't written poetry yeah. since, you know, but yeah. when you're left to your own accord, it's crazy what comes out of you mm. and, and just in your own psyche. And, and what I also took from that was prison, I still had social a network. But when I was in the watch house, I was alone for five days. That was probably the worst time of my life because I never experienced that. I'm an extrovert. And all of a sudden, I'm alone with my own thoughts and, and a book, a Wilbur Smith book about Africa, actually. I read the whole thing. It was just fucking big um, to escape. And it was just, that was, I realized, man, social connection, like, how it, it's it's so important. It's so important because my body was hurting. Obviously, I wasn't getting sunlight and whatnot, but I just wanted someone to talk to, just anything. And it's mm-hmm. I, like that uh, solitary confinement. Fuck, there'd be there'd be nothing worse. Yeah, you know, I couldn't imagine. Well, yeah. worse. And, I, and I think like sitting sitting and being okay with yourself in in confinement is just so hard. But I also think that it's very important because when we get older and our bodies start to fail us, we are forced inwards, no matter what. Like the Tibetan Book of the Dead talk about when you lose your eyesight and your hearing and you know you smell and everything as you start to die and you're forced to go inwards before the dying experience. And I thought it was just a cool concept the other day. It's like that's why meditation and self-introspection is so important because without that, it could be very daunting to the ego, that whole new experience into the new realm. Mm. And I love the, I love the fact that we're born, we're born out of one consciousness and then we – develop our ego and then we almost go back to a toddler state as we get older and older and older you know what i mean and we have we need someone to look after us again as we're 100 or whatever benjamin button yeah yeah unless you're benjamin button yeah (laughs) but yeah it's it's an interesting concept i just i think it's cool and that's what i've I've had a lot of self-reward i reckon going through meditation and and things like that and i can see that you're um you're doing that eh? and i can see are you you reading a lot of um carl jung and stuff as well uh, yeah, Carl, Carl Jung's been been phenomenal. I, I, I sort of fell into his work through following people like Jordan Peterson, and yeah, so forth. And Jordan Peterson described Jung as a terrifying uh, <laughs> intelligence, and uh, he said the same about Nietzsche as well. Nietzsche and and Jung were were similar in brilliance, but very different in outlook. Nietzsche became. Um, extremely cynical and and died a very, very cynical, uh, nihilistic man, whereas Jung uh, lived to the ripe old age in his 80s and and died a very, you know, happy, Mm. go lucky older man ready to face his next adventure. The difference between the two was a fundamental belief um, system in something greater than themselves, whereas Nietzsche believed God was dead. Uh, and, wow. and Jung certainly never never spoke on that. In fact, he was always concerned about the more mythological, metaphysical, less tangible aspects of our existence. Nietzsche spoke more about the tangible aspects of it. So I think um, once you start delving into that metaphysical realm, uh, the the <laughs> Jung, there's Jung no will, lid. <laughs> You know, I think I think it's very difficult to to actually have fear. The interesting thing about you, though, uh, in his mid mid thirties um, or late thirties, actually, he essentially lost his sanity and entered a really deep psychotic state, 
diagnosis probably now would be would be schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder bipolar. Who knows um, what the exact details were? But some of his most seminal work was written during that brief. Uh, well, I say brief, it was, I think it was a few years where he was unmedicated and his wife cared for him. He, he, some of his most brilliant work was done when the veil of sanity was lifted and he entered that realm of insanity and chaos. And I guess he saw the world beyond, um, which also kind of intersects a lot with, with people that have, um, uh, have conditions like schizophrenia and enter a deep psychosis that there, there really is a extremely focused obsession on the metaphysical and they really do talk more about the spiritual aspects of existence such as god and the devil and and uh they get they can get very very obsessed with it um so it almost feels to me like the the uh, we we it, to to see the nature of reality, you've almost got to lose your sanity. So it's not necessarily compatible with yeah. the life that we built around us. In a lot of ancient cultures, when a person entered deep psychosis, th- th- those people were revered as people that were called upon to receive a great download. You mm. know. And, um, um, and those people were cared for and and looked after. So uh, I think I think the modern rational world that we've built around us uh, has taken away from many aspects of the metaphysical, and uh, that to me is a, is a is a great pity. Yeah, uh, I'm certainly doing my best to delve in it as much as I can, uh, but also trying to keep my sanity as I do that. It's <laughs> it's, a, it's, and, a, it's a fun balance, and also it's like so out there to people. You know what I mean? Like, especially if you're growing up watching the news and stuff and um, a lot of the stuff's going to be super out there and hard to, like, for instance, me pulling tarot cards, people think I've lost my mind. Like some of my good friends think that they're like, oh, he's gone. He's, he's done for. There's no, yeah. he's no, there's no coming back. And that's pulling tarot cards. That's not even delving into Carl Jung or, you know, like whatever. It's just. <laughs> yeah. It's and like- <laughs> Jake did a tarot card skit and everyone thought it was real. Because he pulled the victim card three times. <laughs> and, then he set it up. <laughs> and then he was like, no, no, it must be. It's obviously not something wrong. And he puts it, you know, and obviously we set it up. And the people were messaging like. But heaps of comments like, oh, I was going to say you guys portray the victim every yeah, now and then. And <laughs> yeah. And, um, fuck, it was funny, man. Just like great. seeing the serious of it all come out. And you, and you can just laugh at it, you know. I know. Um, if you look at when back in a few years ago during one of my check courses, man, one of the drills I had to do was. Write down my three most dominant archetypes, yeah. Jung, Jung perspective, and then write down like a triangle. It was almost, and then write down the negatives and the positive, or or the yin yang of that. Too much of that, too little of that, and see where am I playing that. Hence, worry was one of them. You know, too pulling that too hard would be. All right, am I am I raising my voice? Like if someone's challenging me, am I going at them too hard? And and like that would be a negative aspect or a mother archetype would be smothering and, and so much that they're controlling them and those sort of things. Have you ever reflected on, on your life and in, in saying what would be your say three most dominant archetypes that you, you feel like is, is where you're at at the moment in your journey? Yeah, I have um, reflected on it. I, th- I think I was, I was born into a into a pretty brutal civil war, you know, destined to become a child soldier because that's what what happened in my country in Sri Lanka, that children, once they were old enough, picked up the arms and, and fought, uh, often on the front line, often used as suicide wow. by wow. a pretty brutal, um, uh, brutal you know, war. Um, and, and, you know, we escaped that. But I've never really forgotten that that would have been my destiny had we not escaped it. And and uh, and to be honest with you, I think I would have made a pretty pretty good soldier uh, because because I suspect that's my nature. You know, in 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 periods of self reflection, I do believe my soul has fought many battles as bodies and and uh, almost thrive in that setting of war. You know, I. Mm. I Feel like I'm I'm always ready to go to war and um and and that can be a negative thing. Whilst it's great to be able to 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 have that sort of spirit to to fight against the world that really uh, wants to push 
people down and push individuals down. It's mm. great to be a larger than life personality. Sometimes that spirit can spill over into your personal life, right? Mm. Where um, you can you will potentially that, that type of warrior archetypes are prone to prone to fits of temper and rage. And so um, it's 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 certainly for me. I mm. think the warrior archetype would be would be something that I reflect uh, that would would be would. Uh, uh, would certainly resonate with me. Mm-hmm. And um, I've always had this eternal um, search for knowledge. Uh, the, you know, I don't know what that archetype would represent, but but it's this eternal curious streak, the, the wish to kind of accumulate as much knowledge as I can. Whilst that can be a great thing, again, too much detail kind of distracts away from from that inside aspects of ourselves, we 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 can become too much mind. We can become overpowered by our thoughts. So it appears it's really about rather than sitting at the polarities or the poles, it's about unifying the poles to exist within a singularity. And a singularity to me is fundamentally the spark from which everything was was born. You know, when we talk about the Big Bang, we talk about and at a certain point, the universe was a single dot or a spot. That's termed, the actual definition for that is a singularity. When we talk about artificial intelligence becoming self-aware, the term to describe that is singularity. Of course, we haven't achieved that. Mm. So it's almost like singularity Singularity to, to me is God because if we're making something self-aware, a machine self-aware, we're funda- fundamentally imbuing it with the power of God, that's that's why I believe it's 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 turned to singularity. So I suspect when we stop existing on the poles and exist within that that middle range of singularity, is sort of getting closer towards the mind of God. Uh, but I'm certainly nowhere there. You know, I'm still very much on that phase of. Uh, understanding where my poles are and experiencing those full range of um, or full spectrum of uh, emotions and, and 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 learning. Yeah, and that's exciting. Hey, as as you get older, like just how, how getting older is so exciting because you can constantly keep learning and becoming more wise to help people, and, and that fires me up. Yeah, <laughs> and and if when you do it healthy, man, because I've got yeah. so many mentors that you know sixties, seventies, mm. and they're they're fine. Like they move around fine, can still sprint. You know yeah. what I mean? If if they're on that Lovely. level of of respecting the body, and I I was gonna say because sometimes it's easier for other people to see your archetypes than yourself, right? And I was gonna say for you, what what comes through to me intuitively is is first was warrior, second was philosopher, and third mm-hmm. was king. And Lovely. and for me, obviously the philosophers what, what you spoke about, but king to me is what. You're speaking about, you're speaking your truth, but you're speaking it from a centered place. And that mm. truth for all the king really has to have that that warrior in you because that's part of it. And also the philosopher to teach your your learnings, but also staying centered because I'm obviously, especially in the world of social media, there's the polarities. So you're going to say something and someone's going to come at you and say some that's bullshit, right? But where you lose is when you come at them and say, no, nah, that's bullshit. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? But you don't do that and that's respectable and that's that's how um, – that's, that's centered. That's staying centered. That's staying calm and that's what you want out of a leader that's not being pulled too far one way or the other because it's, it's what's going to keep us all alive. And and for, as a, if I reflect on a tribe and I'm constantly doing that to myself, I'm constantly reflecting about – a friend gave me a, a good tip couple of things you could do you could say what would a king do but what advice would you give your child in the same situation if if whatever the situation is that you're in right now it automatically puts you in that that position of of uh it's like inner guidance hey that we all have mm-hmm. that we can all go to at any time but our head gets in the way and our ego gets in the way but we still have this inner guidance that we all know the answer i know i'm not meant to give the finger to the guy that cuts me off i know i'm not meant to <laughs> Uh, react to this and that and it's we know it but it's about doing it and that's the journey of the king and the queen that i take mm. from the young stuff anyway mm-hmm. you know 
That's, uh, that, that's thank you. I appreciate your your kind words there and kind of describing the archetype. You're right. It's it, sometimes when you're living the ego, it's very difficult to actually understand who you are, and it's perhaps easier for more intuitive people externally to appreciate that. Um, the ego is important, right? It gives us our sense of self in a world. It, it's the thing that allows us to build a life reproduce bring another life into it uh into 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 um <laughs> into the construct of space and time or the prison planet um, <laughs> and, um, and 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 also without the ego there, there is really no survival um you, know, you 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 look at a lot of people that achieve self actualization such as buddhist monks and eastern philosophers that are constantly meditating um, what what are, what are that what is their service to to fellow man? Um, there is no service because they they're basically on a journey to kind of really understand themselves, and that's an honourable journey. Mm-hmm. But get get too stuck in that, you, you you can no longer be a warrior for the people around you that potentially are suffering. So um, perhaps we'll reach that point one day where. Where we're we're able to meditate, you know, all the time, twenty four hours a day. But but at the same time, I don't see any utility in that for the current state my soul is in, in terms of a journey. I'm I'm more about well, if there is injustice um, in in the, within the construct that I'm in, then I'm, then I'm going to do my little bit. You know, I'm not saying that I can overturn it all uh, by myself. I'm not that that um, uh, egoically defined in that regard. But I'm certainly going to do my bit to to see if we can alleviate pain within society, within my small corner of 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 my little my little cultural niche that I've you know carved out for myself for my own community. If that makes sense. Yeah. And if, if everyone it. thought like that, that we're we're going to do a little bit of what we can for our own community, we become these little decentralized yeah. units, and we we establish leadership within these little decentralized units and hierarchies, mm-hmm. and we almost go back to that um, system of of uh, tribes and hunter gatherers where we governed ourselves and and showed respect towards each other. But the nature of man is such that once you've got specific tribes, we go to war with each other. We're such a warlike species, mm-hmm. you know. And part of this journey of self-actualization is realizing what we are. We're warlike apes, and uh, there's um, a beautifully cruel nature almost to us uh, that allows us to do this. But perhaps it's the same nature that will one day allow us to conquer other planets, to conquer potentially the cosmos. Who knows where we are in, yeah. in fifteen thousand years time we we might be a space faring species that is destined to inherit um this this entire universe who knows um, but yeah. there's certainly an element to us that is cruel uh, but it, it it appears that cruelty is also the very energy that drives us to expand and and grow because without that without that polarity being uh, being tapped into we're all fundamentally stuck in an eternal uh, meditative state, contemplating bliss mm. without achieving anything of substance. Do, do you see, um, like, because it's it's obviously there's a lot of negatives and it's the news, right? It's the media and there is stuff happening. There's, there's wars everywhere, right? But do you see it improving in in linear of time? Like, because we can look back on Genghis Khan, then we can look back on World War Two, then we can look back on so many wars right do you see that it's just a never ending obviously never end there's always going to be war but do you feel like we're becoming more connected or less during time we're, we're more interconnected through mediums such as the internet but we've also become more disconnected to the true nature of ourselves mm-hmm. because we've uh, learned to identify but with the body rather than the uh, soul. And this is why the social media algorithm would promote a, a video or would garner more likes when someone's essentially exhibiting their physical self rather than a man pouring his heart out, talking about the concepts that we are exploring on this podcast and that wouldn't garner the views. Mm. So it, 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 to me, uh, I feel like, I like we're at a, a point in our society where we're really trapped within the physical world, where we're we're identifying too closely with that, rather than uh, actually exploring the metaphysical side, which is the true nature of ourselves. 
But the way this construct is, is designed, I suspect, is that it's cyclical, right? Society reaches a pinnacle and there is some sort of intrinsic process that resets us back down to a hunter-gatherer stage and then the process repeats itself again. It's like the Tower of Babel, right, this in ancient Babylonian tale uh, in the, in, or in a biblical tale, I should say, where, where man reached a pinnacle of technological uh, advancements on par with the God, and, he, and they built a tower which reached into the sky, and when that happened, the powers that be struck it down and reduced it to nothing and uh, on a cataclysmic um, level, and uh, mankind had to start again. When you look back at our history, and certainly history is written in a way to almost hide these things, but you've had beautiful uh, historians such as Graham Hancock and, and um, scientists such as Randall Carlson that have spoken about it multiple times, there appears to be cyclical cataclysms that drive us back down to humbly, uh, to humility. So we've reached this pinnacle of arrogance and identification with the body. We go and go to war with everyone else, and then something happens that reduces our numbers down, and then we're like, hey, shit, there is actually beauty to our species, and look how how we're, we're clinging by our fingertips uh, or by our fingernails to, to a rock to try and survive. Let's help each other out. And we build back up, build the numbers out. We become strong again. And then these issues with, with um, conflict uh, arise, corruption, mm -hmm. and then we reach a pinnacle, then we uh, reset. So I suspect that's the nature of it. And the, the matrix... Beautifully described that, you know, in the third part when Neo meets the architect of the Matrix, he tells Neo there is no such thing as free will, Neo. This um, this Matrix has reset multiple times, and I've met versions of you previously, and we've gone through the same conversation. This is a um, this is a prison where there is no free will. The only free will that you've got is the ability to observe the decision that, that was already fated and, and wonder why that decision was made. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah, man, that's um, that's cool. I always, I always ponder on that, thinking: is there free will, or is our journey already made? And the people whose lives are misery, is their journey already designed like that? Because it, it's, it's, it's a deep question, and it's, it's um, because I've heard, I there's one experience that I had was there was a girl, and I actually heard the audio recording of a, of a, a psychic that she went and saw. And the lady was just some some lady that had a tile company, like her husband had it, but she was a she seemed authentic, right? And then she goes, Oh, your boyfriend's gonna cheat on you in when you go overseas in Bali. And this happened like two years before this happened, right? But you're gonna meet a guy, this is when I was in Karatha, you're gonna meet a guy and he's gonna be into health and he can show you the way it's it's gonna be. She went to Bali, boyfriend cheated on her, went back home, I moved to Karatha, met her with my sister, met met this girl. And then she's like, oh, that's the guy. Like, and all this happened. And who knows? It could be a crazy coincidence. But that this happened. This was pre-written from this person in some sense. And that all happened. So that's that tells me like, oh fuck. Like, I can't obviously put all my weight on it, but is it all pre-written? And we're just on this journey. I never I guess we'll never know until I can go ask those archaic records and <laughs> they'll let us all know about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think I think if we look at it this way. A simple particle of light, a photon, um, because it moves at the speed of light, experiences no time. So it, for, for a photon, if you could look into a mind of a photon, it still exists in the same space that, that, that occurred when the Big Bang occurred. So the Big Bang, the future, the past, the present, everything simultaneously exists for a photon. Mm. So when you study the behavior of a photon, you, you think to yourself, how can there be free will? Mm, <laughs> yeah. interstellar yeah um, <laughs> but the free will that we've got is if we can think of our true selves our souls as outside of space and time then you've got the free will to be able to observe this animal called Callum or Jane mm. or Pratt going through their life and making these decisions and then allowing that free will to wonder to ponder why is it I'm making that decision that's the only free will that we've got to be the observers yeah selves and our own behavior we're seeing it it's a magic that's 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 right and i feel like that is our primary self yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah and that's um beautiful combo mate. Yeah, i know thanks, i know you're a busy man so we'll, we'll let you go but 
Um, what's uh, obviously everyone can follow you, Doctor Prime. If you type in Doctor Prime, it's gonna be the first one that pops up. P R A N on um on Instagram. But what's what's your on as as you leave? Like, what's your your goal for two thousand and twenty? What are we for? Yeah. What's your goal for what's what's your intentions for this year? Uh, 2024, striving towards uh, becoming more free from the system that keeps me enslaved, um, which I think is the um, is 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 my primary goal. It's, mm-hmm. it's freedom. Um, it's perhaps repairing relationships that I've um, uh, allowed to uh, go to waste, where I've assumed that people will always be there as I go on this journey. I, I think certainly um my my endearing wife you know my dear wife who who's um been a huge supporter of everything i've done i've um almost neglected her in this journey that i've gone on and uh possibly my kids as well there's been an element of sacrifice so i I, i'm really looking forward to kind of um um dating my wife again and yeah, uh, finding out uh, what she's been up to in the last few years because I think <laughs> I've really been focused on my my journey um, and and just being the best doctor I can, um, you know, to, to my patients and really connecting deeply with all my patients, making them laugh and uh, making them know that perhaps pain is part of the journey that they've got to carry, um, you know, that, 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 that um, you know, there's an element of sacrifice almost, you um, for for existing within this and um yeah man i'm just i'm just learning i'm just curious i'm still that curious kid that that digested as many books as he could uh when he was Mm -hmm. when you know when i was um you know old enough to be able to walk i'm still that same kid and um i just i just want to keep keep evolving not remaining static and uh not becoming too focused on topics such as nutrition you know that's the sort of thing that will get me the follows and get me the likes and get me the notoriety but i don't want any of that i want to be able to explore everything and be a um uh, uh, be a uh, polymath, which is a which is an individual that is able to to tackle and um, and uh, and grow within many disciplines, with many varied interests, uh, and that's my goal. Amazing, yeah. dude! I know. Um, Alan Watts said to Ram Das um, when he's going through something, it sounded kind of similar to you. He said, um, "You're in the fourth grade. Why don't you try taking the curriculum?" as opposed to being here on the earth instead of wondering what's out in the spirit realm and stuff like that. And then, cause he was going so big into the acid and all that. I know, you know, rum dust, but I just thought that was amazing and fitting for the, what you're talking about with your wife and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've really vertically elevated into dimensions above uh, space and time. That's so much so that I've almost become within space and time. Hmm. What is that? Oh, the dog's got a little thing on its neck and it oh. must have pressed it and it rings my phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those tile things. It's yeah. the universe, dude. Yeah. It's yeah. Our, yeah. our destiny. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on, man. We're going to yeah watch you closely and yeah, yeah. we, we uh, will definitely um, have to link up in the future. Like yeah. I had an image of coming down that way soon and us yeah. coming down and you know come visiting and filming it or something like that it'd be fucking awesome to hang out again yeah man. i'll be going down to the embassy to get my visa sorted and and we're actually doing a talk at cindy's summit too so i'll keen mm-hmm. to ask your advice on um just public speaking and that but i won't take any more of your time but yeah yeah i'm sure you've, you've got some gems of wisdom for that uh, i appreciate that guys i've enjoyed the chat today thank you i hope it's not too esoteric for your followers but yeah, um uh, yeah, you know, I, I think, it. I think uh, it's important to stay curious. And yeah, let's connect when you're back in Sydney. Hell Definitely. yeah, brother! Thanks, Much bro. love, dude. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. See you guys.